Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are here at, on Michaelmas Day, beginning our annual conference for the Anthroposophical Society in America. My name is Tess Parker. I'm the director of programs, and I am very pleased and honored to be your host uh, for this series. We are beginning an online series called Enkindling in the East, three-part series. And today we will have a tour of the model of the first Gertianum um, and, uh, from Esther von Gerster, as well as a presentation from Daniel Hafner. So we are just so glad you're here. And at the end, we have a treat of music from Velsum Voices. So stick on to the end. Wanted to open this time together by first lighting a candle, if you have one. And I will also light one here as we open with a verse uh, read by Katrina Hoven. Katrina is a recent uh, hire for our ASA staff. She's supporting the programs and communications and we're just so pleased to have Katrina Hoven here with us. So here we go. Michael, lend me your sword that I may be armed to vanquish the dragon in me, fill me with your strength, that I may bring into confusion the spirits who wish to paralyze me, work in me, so that the light irradiates my eye, and that I may be led to deeds worthy of you, Michael. Thank you, Katrina. So here we are opening our conference space on this day, full of meaning. Um, I know many of us are feeling this transitional shift and the tests and trials that come with this time. And we really host and open this space for it to be a place for you to come and collectively pull, pull that strength down together so that we can meet what is coming towards us. So we are um, leading up to meeting in person in the District of Columbia in Washington, DC next week. We're very excited to see some of you who can make it. And those of you who will be live streaming along with us, you will definitely be there with us uh, virtually in spirit. So yeah, today, really exciting to have um, this tour of the model of the first Gertianum and really turning our attention towards this year of the anniversary of the burning of the first Gertianum. Uh, our conference this year has themes really connected and rooted into the foundation stone and the foundation stone meditation. This line uh, from the foundation stone meditation let from the east be enkindled what from the west takes on form was a guiding principle as we think about this conference being held in, in our eastern seaboard, in our eastern region, and then also beginning, choosing to begin further east um, from Switzerland and kind of tuning into our roots and foundations with the Gertianum. So let us kind of stretch our healing uh, across the globe and across connecting our hearts to one another, all who are here joining us today. Um, we can practice uh, learning to connect across time and space as much as possible in this time and, for, and attuning to the quality of that connection and how we can continue to enkindle and foster connections both in person and uh, across this Zoom uh, feature. So if you have any questions, uh, please just chat with me or Katrina or Angela Foster during this time, but we will um, keep the chat just for the host. So please um, just try to settle yourself and, uh, and 
and hold your attention. And I'm going to turn it over to John Bloom, General Secretary for the Anthroposophical Society in America, with some opening words, and then we'll go to the tour. Yeah, thank you, Tess. Um, and welcome, everybody, to what is the beginning of a, a year celebration heading toward the, the 100 years as well. And I, I really, in thinking through how to introduce this time and to make everyone aware of the breadth of the work that happens under the broad heading of Anthroposophy and, uh, and the society as well, and how many people are touched by those who have a link to the work that we all share. Um, it's, it's quite a tremendous exercise to hold the, that breadth of uh, and field of energy. And it's quite a responsibility at the same time. And what came to me really clearly for today, particularly because it's Michaelmas uh, and the 29th was this whole question of courage. And of course, Michael and Courage, those two have always seemed to go hand in hand in some ways. And I have to say, I, I asked myself, Courage for what? And um, then I landed on one of the teacher early teacher meditations that comes at the end of the study of man. And it is the courage for the truth. And that really jumped out at me as being something so relevant to our, our time now, where truth itself is a, it's under attack. How do we know what truth is and how do we find that? And how important that linkage is with the spiritual world in, in the guidance of Michael to be attentive to that as, as a background so that we can stand in the world for truth, even as complex and as complicated and politicized and difficult uh, that may be. But that's our work and we need that kind of guidance. So I wanted to actually open with the Michaelmas verse that Rudra Steiner gave as his last address before, uh, actually it was his last public address because it's a, a verse that I work with personally, regularly, all the time. And I think it's so critical that we know that we have helpers, that there are places we can turn to, and, and even Michael has helpers to work with us. So this is from September 28th, 1924, 98 years ago, nearly. Offspring from powers of the sun, radiant spirit powers blessing all worlds. For Michael's garment of rays, you are predestined by thought divine. He, the Christ messenger, reveals in you humankind sustaining holy will of worlds. You, the radiant ether world beings, bear the Christ word to human beings. Thus the herald of Christ appears to longing, thirsting souls to whom your word of light rays forth in the world era of spirit man. You, the pupils of spirit knowledge, take Michael's wise beckoning. Take the world's will's word of love into your soul's high goals actively. Thank you. John. Thank you. So, last year on Michaelmas, we, Esther gave us a tour of the Gertianum as it stands now, and we are so great, grateful that you've accepted this invitation to share with us the model of the first Gertianum, which is in a room inside the, the Gertianum space. So, um, I am just so excited to see this and you know we all are especially those who haven't been able to make it over to Switzerland it's a great way to connect so um yes thank you Esther I'll let me take it away 
Good evening, everybody. I mean, here it is evening. And I'm really happy to join again on my Kulmas with you to have a tour here in Dornach in this special room, which had only been opened last year. After a long work, more than 26 years, a former a uh, man was who did the lightnings on the stage, Mr. Rudolf Feuerstag. He worked and did this model of the first Gretianum in scale one to 20. So we are standing here in front of the main entrance and I'm going to turn around now. You will not see me anymore, but I'm going to show you also a little bit of the history, what had been before this first building, and then we will have the occasion to enter into the model and see the Goetheanum from inside. I'm not able to turn myself around. Okay. So first a picture of Rudolf Steiner in 1914. Here in Dornach, you see behind these wooden structures. So there was just the beginning of the building of the first Goetheanum. I love this picture because one can see the big hands of Rudolf Steiner. So he was not only a thinker, not only a doctor in philosophy, but he had this goal to bring these idea, ideas into life. And here especially he's on the working place of the first Goetheanum. But before, there had been in 1907, this first, or this one of the Theosophical Congresses, you can also see here, Rudolf Steiner sitting near Marie von Sivers. They were not yet married. They only ma married in 1914 in Dornach. And you can see that in this rented room, Rudolf Steiner had already made draw pillars and also these round so-called seals. There is a drawing here or a picture of the drawings of these seven pillars with the seven forms, which had appeared then not only in the first Goetheanum, but also in this first model of a building in Malsch near Karlsruhe with the blue ceiling, the red walls and wooden pillars. In Munich, they had already bought the land. They had already made the project, but Rudolf Steiner didn't get the permission to build there this double space building. Actually, the intention was to have a theater for the four mystery dramas Rudolf Steiner had been writing and performing in 1910, 11, 12, 13. And when he was then in Basel, in Switzerland, holding a lecture for the Theosophical Society, there was a dentist who then offered to Rudolf Steiner the land here in Dornach. So in Munich, this didn't happen, but then the drawings Rudolf Steiner had already made for the inside, for this first building in Munich, they could be used also in Dornach. I show you a picture of this first model for Dornach. 
where Rudolf Steiner had also made the forms outside. And you can see that above all the windows, there is this characteristic form, the round heavy forms below, and then the light forms like wings above, and each one is different. So the ones who had to make the drawings and the plans, they were quite irritated and they said to Rudolf Steiner, but which one shall we take? And he surely had the intention to have the, all these different forms, but then he decided and he said, let's take the second one here. But on the model or on the real Goetheanum then, we can see that these forms are always the same above the windows and only the last one where it's a smaller space, there is this transformation. On the side entrance, it's this form, you can see it became more large. The heavy part below is more large and the two wings above. And between these two elements of being light and being heavy, there is this balance. So actually it could be the picture of ourselves as human beings standing always between the being light and having good ideas and the heaviness of the ground. And actually like the trees, like the plants, bringing together lightness and heaviness in a balance situation in the middle. If we go back to the main entrance, this motif is here very clear in its extreme round heavy forms below, the two wing forms on top and also the middle part is quite big in this situation. This is already above the terrace and below the entrance with the three doors. And the whole base was made out of concrete in round forms corresponding to the round forms of the wooden building on top. On the roofs, there were these stone tiles from Norway. They had a greenish shimmering. Here, Rudolf Feuerstag found a good solution to be able to make this also in scale one to 20. And here we are on the other side entrance and the doors are open. So we could imagine that we would come here to the Gutianum. We would walk up the stairs and we would enter. And you can see we would already from the outside door, we would already see into the main hall. We can already see from here the pink windows on the north part. And also here above the door, there is again this motif, but it's quite changed. The middle part is quite big. And we can see that there is like a streaming to the left and to the right. So everywhere we can understand that all the forms are getting in connection one to another. So they are together building, in this case, this situation of the side door with these three doors and not just standing there alone, but standing there as three forms together. And the same above on the terrace, there would be this entrance 
the three windows above and again the side motif. And on this part, on this side, that's the place where the fire started. It's now 100 years. We will have in the night, the last night of this year, we will have the whole night through activities to celebrate the 100 years burning. There had been this Christmas conference and fortunately people had left out the building when the night guardian had entered here in the side space and he had seen that the fire had already developed and they had to let burn down this wooden building. So that's here where it had started, the white hole because it was in a white wood, white beach. And from here we come to the backside of the Goetheanu. And you can see how beautifully Mr. Feuerstock, as he was also working with electricity, he even made the lighting, the lamps inside and the curtains and the plants. So one can really have the impression to be there with the first Goetheanu. So maybe even now you see it from far away, you don't notice it's a model, you could believe it is really, we are at the first Goetheanu. This is the back door, a very high door. It has a smaller part below and the higher part above. So they could open this big, big door to bring in the sceneries for the stage. In the actual Goetheanum now, here behind the terrace goes on. So nowadays we can walk all around the building. In the first Goetheanum, this was not possible. There was this back side closed only for people who were working on the stage. So they could enter these doors behind. They could be in here, but it was a big polarity between the stage, the small cupola, and the big cupola, the auditorium for the visitors, for us as guests, as people coming to watch the dramas. Rudolf Steiner also made, after his drawings, he made first this model. So this was the model actually where, which was used for all the people carving here, the bases, the seven different forms in the main hall. Also the seven different capitals in the main hall as singular forms. And on top of it, in the architrave, then following the same forms, but now transformed in a movement from the first to the second to the next pillar. And here in the middle, we have this crossing of the two movements, the movement coming from the beginning here, rising up, coming down to the pillar, rising up, coming down to the pillar. Already here we can see how it is separating and how the movement is turning backward towards itself, like a self-consciousness is developing. And this movement stops here in the left snake form. And on the right side, the other snake is the beginning of this movement, which goes on then, becomes complicated and ending in a drop above the seventh pillar. So this situation is actually our time now. In the capital, we can see how the form is closing 
we are like an eye which is a ego feeling itself and closing towards the others and in the next capital we have this form from above now in one form in this mercury form which would be another aspect of our ego standing in the middle but understanding also our neighbors and friends even crossing in front of us and like a, a picture for a new community and then we would start in the future to move together like a dance here like holding hands on the edges and from above there is this listening form and a big space between us receiving the spiritual and new ideas and then the seventh art the social art which we are starting to develop today that's the picture for it and these seven forms, they have six spaces in between. And so on the stage, there are six pillars. And you can see that they are very fine. If we look back in the main hall, the pillars become bigger and bigger. And here they are all more with the gesture that they are like coming from above and landing, sitting at the end on the bottom with these forms, which are actually chairs. So Rudolf Steiner was very severe that people would not put anything on these seats. One time a eurythmist, she forgot to take off her watch and then she had put it here on a chair and Rudolf Steiner said it's not possible because here on top and we will see it then in the model here on top there was the figure painted which was sitting invisibly down on the chair so these are all things to look at, to learn about, to think about. And the more we work with it, we can understand how this building is like a picture for ourselves with different principles of construction. So the main hall, we could say, it is the most the principle of our physical, and the pillars in the small cupola or the whole construction principle is more the etheric. And to think that this place here is the stage. So that's the place where the mystery dramas by Rudolf Steiner had been presented, or this is the goal of this whole building that it is a theater and in this circle here people were performing these contents of the mystery dramas so all the questions about human life life and reincarnation and all the different destinies of people so it's more the astral level so we have the physical principle, the etheric principle of the sculpture, and then inside the astral, like the astral body in ourselves. And at the end, like in a third space, there is this third space, which has also an architrave. So it's like a a new element in this double cupola building and it's the place for the statue of the representative of humanity so this would be the aspect of the eye 
So now we go inside, we can go down. And we can see the whole thing now in wood. Before this was just a white plaster, but here we can see that all the pillars, the seven pillars, the color of the wood is different. So each pillar was in a different wood. And going to the small cupola on the other side, we can also see that from the light birch wood, it's also going through the different colors back to the white beach near the statue, which was made out of elm wood. And there is even an actor or a eurythmist standing on the stage so we can see the relationship of the whole cupola with the paintings, the statue, and a human person in the middle. So we can also see the seats were quite big. And here in front, this nice form of the speaker's place, which had also burned. This had been recarved and we also have it now in the second Goetheanum and sometimes it's appearing and people are talking out of it. It's really like the form of the larynx. And actually from here, it's quite covering the whole space of the scene. Above the statue, the same picture was also painted the representative of humanity between Ariman and Lucifer. And then there are the different culture epochs. First, the Slavic time, so in future, then it goes back to Persia or Germany. And then Egypt, Egypt Greece, and then this actual picture so-called Faust, having this experience of closing and having this inner experience, which is receiving then above the first pillar, this child. This had been painted on this side by Rudolf Stade himself. And he had wished that the painters would paint the northern part in the opposite colors. But he didn't mean to have green here. He said, the green is only appearing in the big cupola. So we could say here, it is like what we know from the rainbow between red blue and purple, there is this green. And in this uh, big cupola, in the middle, we have the light, the lamp, which would represent also the yellow, the blue behind, and where yellow and blue meet, it's green. And in front, from the stage, there comes this red activity. And we also have the culture epochs, but we also have the times, the first times of creation of humanity and on the earth. And it had been painted quite differently than what we can see today in the main hall. So the painters at that time, they had a, an academical um, probation. So they tried to interpret Rudolf Steiner's sketches. This would be the Indian epoch. And the motifs of our time over here. 
And the Persian epoch, Atlantis, and Egypt, and Greece above the first pictures of the creation of the senses and the human body, the plants on earth, up to the so-called paradise when the senses were opening and humanity started to think and separation of the sexes and this moment then near Greece as the moment of transformation of the thinking and you can see how differently they had been making it. The windows also had been made very differently from the sketches by Rudolf Steiner. We can't see them very well now because it's too dark outside, but they were very, very different and they all melted with the fire. So in the second Goetheanum, Asya Turgenev, she could do a new interpretation and she was very true to Rudolf Steiner's sketches. But the colors are there, the pink windows, the purple, the blue and the green windows. Behind we have the organ, like today too, and the entrance behind into the main hall with all the seats. And even the heating is there and everything had been carved nicely. Even the detail of um, the heating under the windows, there were these nice forms. Everything was carved and nicely done in the first building. So I hope that you could get an, a feeling or have this experience to be with me here in the first Goetheanum. And I wish you a good uh, continuation of your Congress. And as John said, the courage to follow the truth and not to fall into all the lies. That's what came clear to me lately that it's the lying which is to discover. So goodbye and have a good conference. Thank you, Esther. Wow. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. I appreciate all of what you brought and how you brought it. And thank you so much. Oh. Thank you. It's really quite something to go in there. Extraordinary. <laughs> Yeah, I just feel to be able to hold those images, even though you're moving through the phone and it's it's a little removed, I still feel like that was really, really nourishing for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Quite beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And all the information you brought in and the the extra details, the watch on the chair. It's just, you know. It's such an interesting little detail that really brings so much. Thank you. So, yeah, we'll move into the next part of our program, welcoming Daniel Hafner, calling in from Germany, Nuremberg, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, he works as the Christian community priest there. And some of you may know him, he's been doing some programming in in collaboration with the Rudolf Steiner Chicago branch. So some of you might have seen uh, these online presentations. Um, and yeah, I believe, Daniel, you also said you offer introductions to anthroposophy for young adults, which is so necessary. And I do hope you continue with that um, in, your, in your work. So we are really grateful that you joined us today to kind of continue on this theme and, and bringing in uh, the meaning and symbols and holding the first Gritianum and beyond into our uh, 
current day. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Tess, for organizing everything, and Katrina and everyone else who helped. It is Mikomas Day when we have an unusual possibility of connecting with this archangel. We can always connect with the spiritual world, but at certain moments in the course of the year, there's an enhanced opening. Michael is the being who makes it possible for us to develop on earth a spirituality consonant with the intelligence of human beings. That's how Rudolf Steiner characterizes him in one of the karma lectures which he gave near the end of his life. That is, our evolution has brought about a kind of a split where the inner longing of the human soul for a deeper reality then meets the senses, for spirituality, for inner experience of certainty and truth and goodness has become increasingly divorced from our striving for the understanding and mastery of the outer world of the senses. For centuries now, the people who have driven for natural science and technology have found it necessary to set aside anything resembling a higher soul spiritual nature, anything resembling religion or mysticism or indeed knowledge of the higher worlds and its attainment. And perhaps that need not be condemned, but was an evolutionary necessity so that we learn to stand on our own ground on earth and test everything critically out of our own individual cognitive search. The problem is it brings about a science and a technology which essentially deny our inner being. This is a tragic necessity of evolution. Michael stays true to the original image of man, which he affirmed at the creation of humanity, a being of spirit able to live in the physical world and imbue it with spirit and imbue it with soul, with beauty, with loveliness, with human warmth. This is the image of a, of a humanity capable of becoming free, inwardly free, which Michael holds upright in the face of dissent, not only from the adversary powers, but even from the other geniuses of the planetary spheres, the other archangels. In that sense, he is faithful to us and to our possibilities, but he never intervenes in the present 
as all spiritual guiding beings did in the past, but waits, beckoning us to develop our own initiative. When we develop initiative, then he is permitted to help. This split between spirituality and the intelligence of earthly humanity. Can be overcome. Anthroposophy is about uniting the two. Not falling into a flaky kind of mysticism. It bypasses thinking because of the difficult experiences we've had with the coldness of the intellect estranged from God, but rather a spirituality which enhances our thinking to full clarity, full power of discernment, and genuine warmth. And that, after all, is what we're all looking for, whether we've heard the name of Michael or Anthroposophy, or whether we haven't. The Goetheanum was a union, as we found hinted at in this guided tour we just had, of all of the different layers and levels and dimensions of our humanity. It was made by the sacrifice of many people who donated money, all of it was donated. People who helped to paint the ceilings, to carve the building inside and out, to sculpt the statue. Rudolf Steiner also had helpers as he sculpted that statue to carve the windows and so on. And when it was destroyed, the pain went all of the way into the life forces. Rudolf Steiner himself was from then on much more loosely connected with his body and could actually only continue to live on earth by dint of conscious spiritual direction of his sheaths from the outside. Because he had put a part of his life substance into that building. It was not simply a mass of inanimate material. It was a being. And the people describe what it felt like to watch that beloved jewel of a building burn in the night under the glorious starry heaven. The next day, Rudolf Steiner said, our work will go on. In those days, he was giving daily lectures, usually several, to different special groups and to the society as a whole, assisting with eurythmy rehearsals, giving eurythmy forms, talking to the painters and to, to the physicians and everybody else. It was a very full program. And to many people's surprise, he said, the program continues unchanged. That's the whole point of this trial. We do not swerve from our work. 
because what we love has been taken from us. And that morning, New Year's Day, they had scheduled a performance of the Three Kings play from Ober Ufa. Some of you may know this play. The angel Gabriel comes in and greets the audience. Their elaborate greetings, first by the star singer and then by the, the angel Gabriel, who says, among other things, God give you good morrow of his grace, a right good morrow, the best of cheer, the Lord of heaven grant each man here. And when the woman who, who was playing Gabriel after this night of the disaster, stepped forth and tried to say, a right good morrow, the best of cheer, she brought, burst into tears. Rudolf Steiner spoke in the months following the destruction of the Goetheanum to the Anthroposophical Society. And he often spoke about the loss of this building. He did not point to the hatred which had caused the building to go up in flames. He invited us, we can say us, if we wish to identify with the anthroposophical movement of that day as well, to search our own conscience and ask how we have flagged in our inner vigilance for the cause of anthroposophy in the world and for how it is presented to the world and how it is misrepresented in the world. Whether we in our own anthroposophical work have developed an energy and a genuineness and a cognitive sincerity and effort that could provide the inner protection for a work of art such as that building. Yes, if you're willing to hear it, he went as far as to say that the burning of the Gartianum is our fault. Again, depending on how much you wish to identify with the us, of those days. He said it was an outer manifestation of an inner weakness in our movement. It was only rarely and in specially prepared groups that he once or twice hinted at the other side, which you might perhaps have thought would be the main topic as to who it was who burned the building down and why. And he, there too, he said it from the esoteric side, from the, from the aspect of inner reality. He said, the opposition arose because the sons of Abel and the sons of Cain had collaborated the split at the beginning of earthly evolution into the Abel stream, receiving in reverence the blessings of the spiritual world and the Cain stream working 
on earth to create something independent. This split only began to be healed at the turn of the ages. That has to do with the resurrection of Lazarus, which is a different topic. But this Lazarus, who then took the name John, gave his name to our building. It was called the Johannes building, after the Johannes figure in the mystery drama, who shares that same name, until in 1918, it was renamed after Goethe. And now, Rudolf Steiner said, when the founders of the Christian community came to Rudolf Steiner to ask for help and guidance in creating a Christian sacramental movement appropriate to modern, independent, thinking, free human beings. That aroused the will to destroy. Because the sons of Abel, as he put it, had come to the sons of Cain. This is his way of describing the inner side of the whole event. He said that the, the two movements needed to begin with a clear independent organization and work separately so that no one would be pressured to join the one movement who was attached to the other that is the anthroposophical movement and the movement for, for the renewal of religious life. He also said later they must come together more and more. He did not specify when later begins. It seems to me that the time has long since come to join forces freely, those who are willing, of course, it must still be possible and valid to go the one path without going the other, as it always was. And he said that the two beings who guide these movements, there is of course a spiritual being guiding the anthroposophical movement. And there is a spiritual being guiding the Christian community. The community of Christians would be a better rendering of this name. These two beings are distinct, he said, but both are servants of Micaiah. That is, up to the level of the archangels, that was his wording, the two movements are distinct. From there on, they are the same. The hatred was able to destroy physically. But not spiritually. I'll now try to show some pictures to suggest what that means, that the being of the Goetheanum is not limited to its physical existence. Wow, lots of options here. Tess, I hope I can figure this out. I'm gonna to try to share. Who can share? How many participants can share this? So if you go down to the green share screen. Yeah. And it should pop up with any screens you have open. So if you have. Yeah, it doesn't though. First, it wants to know one participant can share at a time, multiple participants can share simultaneously, or advanced sharing options. Huh. What should I check? One can share at a time? 
No, um, if you go just a little bit over, just a little bit ah. more to the center. Oh, there it there. is, there it is, there it is. Ah, thank you. I apologize for my no, it's all massive it's all technical incompetence, but now I think I'm within a mere matter of minutes of getting this thing to work. Can you see this picture? Uh, it's, we don't see anything yet. Did you click? Um, if you it have claims you, you are screen sharing. Yeah, so if you have the picture, oh, yeah, now we can. Now you can. Mm -hmm. Not the Goetheanum. This is just to show the sacred architecture of the East uh, in an example. This is Armenia, but the same principle applies all the way over to Japan. Sacred architecture is omnidirectional. There is an inner space where you step out of the experience of time and are surrounded by the sacred in an, in an inner, in an interior that has symmetry in all different directions. This is a building from the fourth century, a Christian church in Armenia. We have this type of architecture in the West in situations where the eternal is invoked. For instance, the baptistry on the threshold of birth or the mausoleum on the threshold of death. In the West, the sacred architecture has the element of time a progression along an axis. You see here at the far east, the apse, a dome invoking eternity, but there is a pathway leading toward that apse. This altar should obviously not be in the middle of the room. It should be up under the apse. In fact, there is an altar up under the apse. You just have to think away this modern altar from the middle of the room, and then you have the correct picture. This split of Eastern and Western humanity is but another manifestation of the split that we've been talking about in our own being. And the Goetheanum brings a synthesis of the pro progressive axis of Western architecture with the symmetry in all directions of Eastern architecture. Let's see if I can change pictures. You might need to reshare a different application if the pictures are there. How about now? This is the Goetheanum. On the left is the west, on the right is the east. The western dome roofed over the auditorium, the eastern dome over the stage. And you can see in the right-hand picture that the tilt of the auditorium was greater than that of the stage, the rake as it's called. And that means that the pillars grew. They are unequal in size. The twice seven pillars in the great hall and the twice six pillars in the small, in the, in the stage. They grow. And especially in the Western part, they grow quite dynamically. In the small dome, they're closer together and they're more slender. The height is 10 times the width in the stage pillars. The pillars of the auditorium, the height is seven times the width. So they're broader and they're, and they're dramatically growing and changing. And as we saw on the tour, the capitals change, the bases change. So that we can say there is a circular symmetry in all directions in each of these two interpenetrating spaces. 
but there is also a, an axis of directional symmetry from west to east, a marching, a progressing, an evolving. And the principle of evolution is especially dynamic in the west. A feeling of repose and the forces of the fixed stars in the east, a feeling of dynamic movement and the forces of the planets in the west. Can you see this one? New yes. one. Yes. That is Rudolf Steiner's model in wood and plasticine. And with some hint of the color sweeps in the Western dome. So that you can see the character between the difference of character between these two spaces. The Goetheanum then is a synthesis of the inner space which each of us needs and the outer space with which each of us can go out into the world and transform it. And the, the, the in-breathing and the out-breathing together make up the complete human being. An inner space and an outer space which interpenetrate, which can be separated by a curtain for certain situations or can be opened to commune with one another. or to put it in conceptual terms, a spirituality consonant to personal intelligence of man. This is a watercolor painting of the Gotanum by Hermann Linde, one of the painters who worked on the ceiling paintings, just to give a feeling of what it was like and how much love surrounded this fairy tale like being set on the hill in the Swiss landscape. And now why can't I find that one? Let me close some of them. It seems reasonable to suggest okay, that the that the Goetheanum already began to approach earthly incarnation when the split was arising, not only in Christianity, in its sacred buildings, but in humanity as a whole, and in each human being. And here, 250 years before the building was built, approximately, is that even correct? Math is hard, something like that. We see a painting with one of the great leaders of humanity dressed as a Polish writer. You can see this in the Frick Gallery in New York City. And the doubts as to its authenticity have, as far as I know, been dispersed and it's pretty well established that it's a Rembrandt. And he's riding through a dangerous landscape with some kind of fires happening in the distance. And there on the hill, there's the Goetheanum, two unequal rotundas interpenetrating. This is merely a hint that the building existed before it existed. Rudolf Steiner spoke of occult columns in the years beginning with that Theosophical Congress of which we just saw a photograph he spoke of occult columns, implying they are present, but they are not yet earthly vi visible on earth. 
and he published a little folder called Images of Occult Columns and Seals, and later the occult columns incarnated, and they took on form as the Gotanum itself, so that, like a human being, the Gotanum has a pre-birth existence. And like a human being, it has a death. This is one of the few photographs of the ruins. On the left, the stage space, what was the stage space? On the right, what was the auditorium? The, build, the, the room where the fire was lit was in the south wing. That would be the far wing in the upper left in this picture. And it was up beneath the skylight, up at the top of that south wing. That's where this white hall was made of hornbeam, which was the room where the Christian community was founded. And when the Christian community was founded, there was an inexplicable storm which lifted off that skylight. The priests were gathered there in front of their improvised altar. Rudolf Steiner himself helped create this altar and all of the different accoutrements which we needed. And, and he was there guiding the whole thing. And the workers from the village were called to put the skylight back in place. And to everyone's amazement, Rudolf Steiner protested because that meant they saw what was happening. And some of these people went to confession with the very priest who was constantly calling for the building to be burned down. So clearly the language seems to speak clearly that that's where they chose to light the fire in that room at the intersection between the large and the small dome where the being of man is healed. They broke into the wall where the two domes intersect in the inner end of the room. This being then like a human being passes through death into an existence after death. Here is a bit of a painting, which I found on the internet. I'm sorry to say, I do not know who painted it. I would love to give her or him credit if anyone can tell me whose it is. But it seems to me quite fitting in these warm colors and the cool colors below with the the forms of the first, second Gautam, and then the warm colors above, where you can see that the first Gautam can be imagined as present in the spiritual realm. Rudolf Steiner said, imprinted into the, the ether of the world through the burning. That means it's it's available now to anyone who chooses to connect inwardly with it. And you can do that with the help of the pictures and the models and all of the other things. And by your own inner activity, you have to reach the reality of the Gautanum today, just as you have to reach the dead by your own inner activity and cannot take them in through the senses anymore. And like a human being, the being of the Gautanum is, of course, capable of reincarnation. Yes, especially for the West, this would be 
a task because we of the West need the confirmation of the senses, the working in the sense world, the biodynamic agriculture, the art impulses of anthroposophy in order to confirm the reality of spirit all of the way down to the ground. That does not mean it wouldn't be significant for Eastern humanity or humanity in the middle either. It would, of course. But the reincarnation of the Gurchanum does not work quite the same way as the reincarnation of a child. It takes the collaboration of probably more than one man and one woman to provide the possibility for this being to, to reappear on Earth. Rudolf Feuerstock's model is undoubtedly a deed that goes in that direction. It's historical and true to the historical Gertianum, which, as we heard delicately hinted at, was not ideal in all aspects. But Rudolf Steiner predicted that once that time had elapsed after the turn of the century, which equal in span to the time before the turn of the century that the Goetheanum began to be built, that Goetheanum-like buildings would spring up. And he said they would spring up all over Central Europe. And to me, it's also a question whether that needs to be limited to Central Europe. He said this in 1914. So, if you do the math, that would mean 2086. That's the same amount of time after the turn of the century. No reason to wait until 2086, dear friends. You can get started with some preliminary work right away. Look for a piece of real estate. Build one with your friends. Because we need that. And if you don't directly build the Gertanum, it doesn't have to be an exact copy. The, the larger question is, how can we work out of the anthroposophical art impulse? That's not the same as I am interested in anthroposophy and I like to paint. But rather, what did Rudolf Steiner actually offer us for the renewal of the art of painting, for the renewal of the art of sculpture, of architecture, and so on? All right, those are some of the questions. Maybe we can close it with such questions and leave it open because after all, Michael asks us for our initiative, and it would seem more appropriate than to close with a dogma. Mm. Yes, thank you so much for those questions. And thank you so much for all that you brought. I was surprised at my own inner experience when you built up to showing then the pic that picture of the moment of after the burning. So thank you for bringing us on that journey and also evoking this, this question and call to action and initiative to, to work in this way and bringing Gertianums all over the place. I will take that into my sleep and see how I can keep collaborating with my coworkers to do that. Um, and then this moment of our work will go on, that really stuck out to me as well. A strong call to action. So thank you for bringing that courage and strength to us, Daniel, on this special day. And we have some time to close with music, which is a great, way to integrate all that we've heard and shared. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, and I will turn it over to Velsum Voices, which is composed of uh, Lucien Dante Lazar and Ultraviolet Archer. Uh, they are putting out an EP towards the end of this year. Um, and they call their genre ancient futurism, which I hope I got that correct. I love that. Uh, so look out for their EP in, uh, as, we, as we get to 
towards the end of this year and they've been really working anthroposophically to collaborate and bring their music to us. So we so appreciate you both. Thank you so much. I trust you'll unmute when you're ready. And it's still muted, just so you all know. Oh, I will help you then. <laughs> there we go. Hello, can you all hear us? Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> Great. We are Belsum. It's good to be back here. It was this time last year when we stood here and performed our very first song that we wrote for the building of the building the temple of the heart conference so it it's truly a circle that is that is continuing to turn for us and here we are again between these two pillars <laughs> yes um Belsum is a musical initiative that is um basically inspired by love and wisdom and um therefore anthroposophy uh and we're so grateful to be singing on the stage that we first formed formed from after hayes archer ginsburg asked us to write this song come to the heart and again we've been asked to write in kindling connection, connection. and the heart rose <laughs> <laughs> um so we wrote this a few days ago and we're gonna hold each other in singing it well <laughs> And hold all of you. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to say thank you real quick to the branch of Chicago for putting these cameras up and these lights for this little event and for our dear members coming to support us. <laughs> And kindling connection, and the heart rose. Jubilee with fire forth, filling the heart, guiding us north. And kindling connection, and the heart rose. If I lose my way, will you lend a hand? When the sky turns gray, will you? understand with sword of sun we are warriors in the darkness to come we will find our worth in kindling connection and the heart rose expansion and contraction and the heart rose as the leaves become the dirt let our thoughts rise in rebirth expansion and contraction and the heart rose take the sun inside let it burn away all the fallen shadows of autumn's face press in here to the earth she will sing for you in the depths of her voice she will harvest you expansion and contraction and the heart rose and kindling connection and the heart rose and kindling connection and the heart rose and kindling connection and the heart rose And our EP is coming out this October, probably in the next two weeks. Um, it has three songs, Temple of the Heart from last year, and two other songs from our Belsum show. Tem uh, New Nightingale, New Rose. Yes, that we've been touring a little bit around the Midwest. Um, and yeah, all these songs are built into harmonic 
choral pieces, basically, with drums. So, thank you. Let's listen to it. Wow, thank you so much. so amazing that we have these pieces of music that are tied in with our conference conferences. That's beautiful. Thank you. Wow. So here it feels like we've really kicked off the conference together. We've, we've opened the space and I truly look forward to the, the next presentations and gatherings that we will have together. So happy Michaelmas and take care everybody. We'll send you the recording shortly after this. So all the best and thank you to Daniel and Esther and Velsam and all and John Bloom and everybody who helps make this possible. Uh, I will let you, I like this part. We can kind of unmute and say good, goodbye. And, and thank you Tess for, for being the orchestrator. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Beautiful presentation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Everybody. Bye. Bye.